Hey guys, my guest today is Nathan Berry. You've definitely heard of ConvertKit and hopefully you've seen some of the other things he's working on related to tiny houses, investing in friends companies, but most importantly, just creating and, and building and supporting the creator ecosystem as he really brings his customers to the forefront of everything he's doing, whether it's sharing their stories on a podcast, writing about them on the blog, or many other ways they do this at ConvertKit. We're gonna to touch on all this today. Nathan Berry, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Okay, so the first thing I want to touch on is actually is not software related. You know, we're in a very weird time right now where everyone's sort of locked down. We also know that your community is extremely important. You've personally built community both online and in person. And I want to go back to sort of pre-COVID days and just ask for your thesis on why you decided to get involved with your friend Brent in buying an old ranch and how that relates to community. Yeah, oh man, well... I feel, if I look back on my journey as an entrepreneur, so many of the inflection points came from people that I met in person, right? Um, say a conference like MicroConf, where there was one years ago that uh, Amy Hoy and Alex Hillman put on called Bacon Biz, which is, was just a fantastic conference. And it was just for the people who were focused on making money, right? And there's all of these uh, events that you hang out with, hang out at and meet someone and they're the one who drops an idea that that changes something for you. Or, or for example, there was this conference years ago called the World Domination Summit that Chris Gillibo um, hosted. And I went in 2012 and I knew no one, super shy, like, okay, I guess I let's do this. I'm supposed to meet people, you know, that kind of thing. And I just decided to walk up and talk to two guys who were standing there talking. Um, turns out to be James Clear, who's the author of Atomic Habits now. But like at the time he had a tiny little newsletter. Had yeah, three books. James yeah, well before anything. And then Caleb Wojcik, who's this incredible video producer. Um, he's done everything for Pat Flynn. Uh, he invented the switch pod uh, with Pat Flynn and like all of this, right? And that's the kind of thing that happens when you show up at an event that's a curated group of people and uh, you have these conversations in person. And so I've always just been a fan of um, great in-person experiences. And, and we've We've started our own conference uh, four years ago, ran that every year except for this year. Um, and so it's just something that I've loved. And so when um, actually Ryan Holiday was the one who texted me and was like, hey, um, we're buying a ghost town and <laughs> like it's closing soon and um, we need more money. Yeah. You know, and with like, Ryan, you got to go, wait a second. Is this a headline he, he's pitching? Cause you know, he's genius mark or is this a real, like, are you actually, is there actually a ghost town we're buying? <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, and I had known uh, Brent Underwood from, cause he has an agency with Ryan and, uh, and they run the website daily stoic together, which is a ConvertKit customer. And so I'd known him somewhat, you know, um, but Ryan was the one that kind of pulled me in. And it was just th this thing where, because it, it was a unique property, and, th and this is uh, Cerro Gordo, which is a 300-acre ghost town in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Um, so when you stand on the peak uh, behind it, if you look to one side, you see Mount Whitney, so the highest point in the continental U.S. And if you turn around and look behind you, you see Death Valley, which is the, the lowest point. Um, and it's just this crazy place. And so then I thought, okay, one, uh, Brent and Ryan and, and their other partner, John, just have this great idea for what they're going to do with it. And I was like, can you imagine the mastermind groups and the like mini conferences and the writers retreats and whatever else that you can have, like the stories and memories that you can make uh, at a place like this. And so, yeah, I had to, <laughs> had to get involved. And so what has happened, obviously COVID changes things and Brent's putting out great content on YouTube. It looks like he's been living there for a while. Have you guys been able to have sort of a you know, mastermind where you're just living in old mining cabins and waking up in the morning and seeing Mount Whitney and Death Valley. And yeah, um, some of that has happened. The property has taken a lot longer, I think, than we originally had thought to get it up and running and, and get it to the point where groups can stay there. So I've actually only been there. Um, I, I've only been there twice and just taking my family down. So we haven't yet had a big gathering because there were things like had to get running water, had to yeah. get, um, you know, get it livable again. And, um, and then there were some big setbacks in there. Like this summer, uh, there was a fire caused by, you know, some really old electrical that burned down the hotel there that it was on its 149th anniversary of opening. 
that the hotel burned down. So, I mean, it's kind of like anything in entrepreneurship where you have these great grand dreams and then it's way, it turns out it's way harder than you thought. And then just when it's really hard, then like there's this crazy setback of like the coolest building in the whole town getting burned down or I don't know the equivalent from like you're in my businesses would be like when you like lose that customer that you fought so hard to get or like that was that stretch thing. Um, can you, can you make an analogy there? If you look at convert kits history and we'll dive more into convert kit here, but is yeah. there, is there an equivalent to the old 149 year old hotel burning down? I think that, so our very first team retreat, um, let me set the stage. So January, 2016, the previous 12 months, we'd grown from 2000 in MRR to a hundred thousand in MRR. So just yeah. crazy growth. We had no money in the bank. We were thinking, should we raise money? I, I think we were spending 80 grand a month and we had like 15 grand of cash in the bank, but we were making- Sorry, net, net burn Net burn was 80 grand a month or gross burn? Uh, so um, gross where, okay. you know, we were still profitable and like the dollar amounts were going up. Like the bank balance is getting bigger. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, like your day's worth of expenses is going down. Right. Cause 15 grand in the bank, when you have five grand of MRR and five grand of expenses, that's fine. But yeah. when you have a hundred grand, like it's not cool anymore. Yeah. And we had so hundred, hundred gram, hundred grand MRR, 80 grand expenses, 15 grand in the bank team retreat. Yeah. So that's where we were. We had basically, we wanted to get the team together cause we had, I don't know, 13, 14 people on the team at the time. And we thought, okay, but we just can't afford it. And so we, cut expenses, doubled down, or we didn't cut expenses. We, we basically locked expenses and then grew our way out of it. And we grew our way from like barely break even to uh, five months later, we had 60%, sorry, 50% profit margins, three months of expenses in the bank. And we did a team retreat to celebrate. And so that was like the big high in entrepreneurship. And the whole team flies into Boise. Um, we have like, everyone's showing up for this team retreat and we get a denial of service attack where someone goes like very deliberate, very malicious, goes to take down our servers. And, you know, so like I distinctly remember picking up Brad, one of our lead engineers uh, at the airport and I show up and he's like next to baggage claim on his laptop, like trying to keep the servers up. And it's that sort of thing where you go from these crazy high and it's like, oh man, I can't believe we pulled that off to the equivalent of, you know, your hotel burning down or like this, like, I don't know how we're going to recover from this. And you always do you know, that's just part of uh, entrepreneurship, but that, that's the journey that we all signed up for. Nathan, I want people to stick around. And so I want you to plant a big open loop here. And then we're going to dive more into the sort of emotional side of the story, going back to when you were doing woodwork at 13 years old, door knocking T today, where's convert kit? What's top line revenue? Yeah. So we're at 25 million ARR right now. And how much profit? Yeah, um, we've been spending a little more aggressively this this year. So we're doing about 5% profit. Um, and then, uh, but at the beginning of the year, we're closer to 20, 23%. And so and next guys, year, we'll return to the 20% mark. 20% uh, EBITDA margin? Yeah. So guys, you want to stick around for that. Something else Nathan is doing, which he puts on his website, is he specifically says $1.8 million paid out to the team. So there's some profit sharing happening here. A lot of you guys who are bootstrap founders are wondering, how the heck do I set up profit sharing without spending $500,000 on legal? So we'll get back to that in a second. But Nathan, take us back to 2013, or sorry, when you were 13, Nathan, I think what, maybe 2005 or earlier? 2003. 2003. 1990. 19, okay, wow, 19. Okay, so we're about the same. You're th what, 30 right now? Yep, thirty. Okay, so 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 woodworking. So first off, what do you remember the moment? Did your did, was there something you really wanted and you needed to make money? And your parents said you got to figure out a way to make money. And then you said I'm going to go sell woodworking. Or what was the genesis of that first thing you created? Yeah, well, for me, like I grew up in a household where money was really scarce. Uh, my dad ran a, a like a Christian college ministry, and so it lived off of donations and support from. Um, you know, churches or other groups. And so money was just not a thing that there was much of. And so my, my parents did a really good job of instilling that, like, uh, if you want money, go earn it. Gotta work and it. the way that I did it was, uh, my dad was really into woodworking. Uh, he built the house that we grew up in. And, wow. um, so we had this like little shop of, uh, it was a lot of like kind of hand-me-down tools, but 
it worked great. And so I would do these woodworking projects and then go door to door to sell them to earn money. And, and, uh, I remember I had made a bunch of these like wood carvings and stuff and we were headed in, it was actually black Friday. Um, so we we're going to head into, into town cause I grew up in the mountains outside of town to do some black Friday shopping. And Hey, Nathan, and, which town I know, obviously, but I don't think the audience. Yeah. Boise, uh, Boise yeah. Idaho. Yep. Um, and so, uh, we were going to do that. And it was one of those things we we're going to head into town at noon or something like, that. and so at 10 AM, I was like, great, I'm going to go wander around this neighborhood, go door to door, and then like pick me up here, you know, a mile from town. And then we'll just see how much money I've made by that. Wow. It was one of those things where I think I made a hundred, hundred and twenty dollars you know, selling these things door to door an hour later when my parents picked me up as, as we drove into town. And that was just sort of the mindset that we always had of like, great, if you want something, I'm not going to give it to you go, go pursue it, go figure out how to get it done. What was your reaction? What was their reaction when you got in the car and emptied your pockets with a bunch of like crumpled up dollar bills? You know, what's funny is I think they were so used to us just as kids figuring out how to make money that they were just like, cool. You know, and there wasn't like, That's it funny. wasn't even this big like celebration moment. It was just like, well, yeah, obviously. <laughs> you know? And who's us, Nathan? How many, how many siblings? I have five siblings, so I am wow. the fourth of six kids. Oh, uh, okay, okay, wow, fourth of six. That's incredible. Okay, and are they, so So, did they all end up just building sort of communities and creators world, or, or did, did one of them end up in like Wall Street finance or something? I do have a brother who uh, works in corporate finance and oh, wow. private jets. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, everyone's all over the map. Uh, I've got a sister that uh, lives in Seattle and works on like copywriting and that kind of thing for, you know, a bunch of big clients like eBay and American Airlines or sorry, Alaska Airlines. Um, yeah. A brother who's a physician's assistant, got a couple of siblings who are programmers, you know, it's just, it's all over the map. And I think that's, you get into a whole nature versus nurture uh, sort of debate, but I think, you know, humans are just very different. Now, Nathan, has your little guy had his, you know, woodworking door to door knocking first sales moment? Um, I don't know. Let me think about this. Well, they, they always, we don't do an allowance or anything. So they, yeah. they come to us with ways to earn money. Um, I think this year probably would have been the year of the lemonade stand or something like that. <laughs> um, just based on my kids are nine, six, and then uh, 11 months. And you know, it's just, it's not a, with COVID, it's not a good year for door to door sales. Yeah. Not, a, not, not a good, yeah, definitely not a good thing. Opposite of what you want to be doing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, wow. 120 bucks woodworking, four of six siblings, 2005, you're 13 years old. You eventually obviously end up, I believe going, going to college. Let's fast forward here a bit. What did you do in college? What'd you study? Yeah. I studied graphic design and then marketing. So I wanted to, I wanted to do graphic design, you know, Photoshop, interface design, and all of that. Um, and I, uh, I went to college super early because all my friends were older than me. Um, I was homeschooled and I wanted to keep up with them. And so I basically asked my parents, um, hey, is high school four years or is high school a set amount of work? And to their credit, they said like, oh, it's, it's a set amount of work. And I was like, great. Can I have that in to-do list form? Because basically all my friends were going to graduate two years before I was and go off to college and I didn't want to be left behind. Um, and so when my parents listed all out and I had older siblings, you know, who had finished high school already. And so they had already figured out like, this will be all the homeschooling curriculum. Um, then I just sat down and, and knocked it out. I remember thinking like, I'm bored when we go on these family road trips from Boise to Seattle every summer. I'm also bored when I do algebra. So why don't I combine these things? And on like an eight hour drive, I do, a month's worth of algebra lessons or something. Um, and so then I graduated college or graduated high school when I was 15 and started going to college. And graduated college, how old? I dropped out of college at 17. Okay. Okay. So why, why the dropout? Were you making just so much money selling your own stuff at that point or why drop out? Yeah. So I was going to college to learn how to make money. This was all a quest of, I want to figure out how I can make money um, and, you know, earn a living and, and, eventually become financially independent. And uh, I had started a web design business by then. It was doing well. Basically, I got my first $10,000 contract. Um, and I called my mom and said, hey, 
I think I think I'm I'm ready to drop out of college. And I expected to have to like convince her that it was a good idea. And she, you know, she'd followed my progress and I talked to her about the web design business I'd been running and the freelancing and stuff like that. And she just said, like, yeah, I expected that we'd have this conversation soon. And so, yeah, my now, claim she, to fame is- Did she have money on the line? What Were your parents helping cover college expenses or anything like that? Or were you paying yourself? Uh, I was paying for it myself. Um, yeah. I got a lot of grants because like the low income, you know, FAFSA grants and, and stuff like that, um, financial yeah. aid. And then the rest, you know, so I dropped out with like $5,000 of, of student loans rather than okay. a crazy amount. So yeah, that was a case where having, uh, coming from a low income family really helped. So you, 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 and we're going to, I want to put all this sort of on a, a mental map, which you've used. And I, I can't credit the person because I forget, maybe you can, the Ladders of Wealth, who created that again? That's, that's just an idea that I've, I've, that was of. you. Okay. I wasn't yeah. sure if you pulled that out of a book or if that was you. Okay. Got it. So, so Nathan has put together this sort of Ladders of Wealth that, that explains how he thinks about wealth creation. And so one of the things you talk about is sort of moving from trading your time to eventually, you know, bundling your hours into project sort of things. Would you call this 10 K sale your, your first sort of bundled agency product where you weren't selling hours? Yeah. And I think that one, I was still, that was probably this transition, right? Between selling hours and like selling an outcome. Um, and and so, yeah, that was an, an early example of a product, but, but still largely, you know, hourly project-based work. Um, but it was definitely on a continuum it was not the hourly web design work that I'd been doing before. It was like, okay, now I'm getting paid for an outcome. And there's starting to be this disconnect between the effort that I put in and the money that I make, which is what we're looking for in entrepreneurship, right? If, as these things are tightly coupled, there's no leverage. But the more those can be disconnected, then there's at least an opportunity for leverage. It can go terribly wrong. And you can have a project that like, like you're a hundred hours in to deliver this outcome that you're not getting paid enough for, then the leverage goes poorly. But, you know, we try to create those situations where the le leverage goes well, goes well, where we can deliver, you know, a ton of value with less inputs and, and get paid for it. Nathan, one of your recent tweets was something along the lines of, is there anything that you've actually committed to and done consistently for a long period of time and not had success? And there were a couple of replies, but I mean, if I didn't know you personally, and I just looked at charts and graphs and numbers, I would sum it up by saying consistency, but both maybe people would say sometimes bad consistency and then good consistency. And so like bad consistency, which, you know, it's not actually bad, but when you look between 2013 and 2015, you were so consistent at ConvertKit. MRR never really got above 5K per month. It was, you know, yep. sort of one to 5K. And then in 2015, something happens and literally the curve of your, your revenue growth shifted. And now it's been like literally consistent for five years in terms of just growth. There's, there's very little like blips happening. Mm -hmm. Is this intentional? Well, I think it's that all of these things take a lot more time. And so we think about if I show up in the right way, then I'll achieve the success or something. And that's true. It just, it often takes a long time to figure out how to show up and what things to work on. And so I can convert it. Things that made a difference were moving from um, like content driven, uh, you know, for trying to grow a, a SaaS business. Content, by the way, is a really hard way to grow a business like go from zero to one and like basic, like no traction to simple traction. Um, and that's what I was trying to do. But if you don't have the community already, it's very hard to do. Um, and it was really shifting from that to a direct sales model of kind of this, uh, this Paul Graham, like do things that don't scale, do anything to get the customer, do custom development work, migrate them all yourself, all that, and do these things to inch forward the progress. Um, and that's what turned into something that, you know, that was actually working. And then, mm -hmm. you know, Naval Ravikant talks a lot about looking for things in life that compound. And so much in entrepreneurship, you know, compounds just like it does in, you know, in investing and everything else where those returns come over time and they come much later. And if you remember, you know, learning about compound interest in middle school, you're like, wait, this isn't actually any good. You're saying that I'm going to put in all of this and then five years later, like this is what I get from it. And it's just, it, it's not impressive at all. And then you have to fast forward another 10 years and 20 years. And you're like, this is incredible. This is mind blowing. How does it turn into that? And it's like, well, 
compounding takes time. And I think in entrepreneurship, we're like that kid in middle school where we're like five years and that's all I get. Like no point. And we fail to look further down the road and be like, oh, but in 10 years, it'll be this. Mm-hmm. And that's what I think everyone does with their companies where let's take a company like MailChimp. Um, I don't have their exact numbers. I'm assuming uh, at this point, based on trends from previous numbers, there's somewhere around 750 million in annual revenue. Um, maybe as much as a billion, but probably not quite there yet. Um, they've been at it for 19 years. And so when I look at the curve that I'm on with ConvertKit and, if, and the curve that MailChimp did, and if we were to overlay those two, ConvertKit is far ahead. Like if we put the start date of the two of them, ConvertKit is far ahead on that curve um, than MailChimp was eight years into their business. And I think this is the point where people go like, wow, you've made it with ConvertKit. You should sell. You should have sold a while ago. Like the moment that first $100 million acquisition offer came up, you should have sold and move on to the next thing. And when I'm like, was that? Uh, I, so we haven't had like a, a crisp, like here's the offer on the table, yeah. but like the private equity people show up nonstop, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, and I just always like say no thanks before it gets to... Uh, just, point? just, just charge for the call. Say, I'll get on a call with you, but it's five thousand dollars for twenty minutes. Yeah, and make a <laughs> That's little. That's a good idea. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, anyway, so I guess what I'm, what I'm saying is, I feel like I'm just getting started, and if I want to build the scale of company that I need to, or that that I want to do, then I need to give compounding time to really kick in. Mm-hmm. And so we're eight years in, in like selling and being done now is it just way too early. And so it's really like, if I want to build a MailChimp level company or a Stripe level company or something like that, then it's like, great, show up for another decade. Mm-hmm. And then we can start to talk about the level of commitment that you have and where the results come from. I mean, Nathan, is it really sort of a, a start and a, and a stop? I mean, everything I'm seeing you do, I mean, this is, this is just you. Uh, it's build a creator community. It's build team members. It's allow your team members to build wealth with profit sharing. You're obviously also making money. You're then reinvesting in friends, businesses, and things you love. And, uh, and you're talking about, you know, now not only multiplying your time or an agency work or now software, but also now capital leverage after that. I mean, what would you do if you sold ConvertKit? I don't even know. Maybe, yeah. uh, build a tiny house community. But you're already doing that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and You're that's the thing of like, it's not this all or nothing um, thing. And that's a really good question to ask when, when those acquisition offers come in or something I'm like, okay, but what would I do? Mm-hmm. And I'd go right back to building software because I love it. And one thing that I love now is the, like the leverage that we have. So for example, this year we launched ConvertKit Commerce, which is our digital product sales platform. And if I were to, like that's something that's just different enough from ConvertKit that it could be its own startup entirely. Mm-hmm. And so if I were to start over and do that, like that initial traction is really hard to get. And it's a lot of work. Obviously having done a successful company, the next one is easier. The relationships that you already have, the brand reputation and everything. But like now for ConvertKit, it's like, oh, we have 250,000 users. And so let's just tell them to use this new thing. And so when you come out with something, you're like, wow, this is getting used by thousands and thousands of people which is like the creator's dream. And so it's one of those things that if you sell it, if you move on, then you lose that or some amount of that leverage. And so I'm just like, nope, I like the leverage too much. I'm going to keep doing this. It's great. And it's so hard to quantify. Like this leverage idea is so hard to quantify. So it's, I want, I want to dig here a little bit. Um, let me just ask a, a bit, you know, obviously commerce and any, we call it sort of a SaaS plus plays, a SaaS business plus mm-hmm. something else, professional services, percent of GMV model, a marketplace maybe. When you look at the commerce business, one of the goals you talk about is, man, I'd love to get to, point, to the point where we pay a billion dollars or help creators make a billion dollars. You launched here in, uh, last year in 2019. How much went through your system in 2020 to creators? Yeah, so we have two different numbers that we track. Um, the first one is like the total amount earned by creators using ConvertKit as email products. Um, and in 2019, beginning of 2019 or, um, or 2018, I'm trying to remember exactly when we launched new APIs so that when people are selling through ConvertKit and using Shopify or Teachable or Stripe or any of these others, it report like it, it includes the reporting of um, where the revenue came from and how much you're earning and it aggregates it across all these different platforms. So you have one creator dashboard. Um, and that's been really cool. 
And actually, uh, January of this year, we passed a billion dollars earned by creators uh, on ConvertKit or yep. through uh, like other platforms. Through the aggregation. Yeah. Through the aggregation. Yeah. And so now um, with Convert Commerce, it's basically like we checked out this big goal, which is on our mission page. And then we said like, done, next. Now it has to be a billion like processed through our payment systems. Um, and that we launched like in private beta in mid-July. Um, and one thing that's been interesting is it is much harder to get traction than I expected. So we're at almost half a million in GMV. Um, and it's fascinating how- That's total um, GMV processed through July. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so it's it's a lot lower. Like if, just for example, in, in the conversation that we were having over email, you're like, hey, have you hit that billion dollars yet? And I was like, not only have I not hit it, but this is hard. Yeah. And it's again, these compound returns that are going to come into play. If you've got to get people to switch over from what they're doing, you've got to get all the beginners who are thinking about selling their first product, right? They're, they made their first $50, their first $100. And it's going to be a few years before they're making 10,000, 100,000. And so like, it's been a really healthy reminder for me of, Oh yeah, I'm I'm starting compounding on a new thing, mm-hmm. and it's gonna take time because I'm that entrepreneur who's like, okay, let's go, let's you know, let's be at a million uh, by this date, and then a million a month by that date, and then you know, um, and just realizing like to get all this momentum to shift, it takes a lot of time, and so I'm having to learn both to put in the concerted effort and to be patient for the results. And how do you think about launching a new product like that? Do you really go deep on a persona and maybe actually use that persona? You call Pat Flynn, say, Pat, I know you do more than a million a year in revenue. We'd love to process all your commerce. What's it have to look like for you to switch over? Or do you try and build something more broad and appeal to a hundred beta users? I think you try to do both because um, you can fall into traps in both ways. Uh, and like we use uh, object, we use OKRs, objectives and key mm-hmm. results. Um, to manage and track our business. And you, what you usually end up doing is having a, a main objective that you're going after. And in our case, like let's say GMV, right? We're trying to, to, we want the most dollars sold. But if you optimize only for that metric, then you might do things that is for short-term gain, but not the long-term. Like we could say like, okay, we're trying to get to 10 million in, in GMV in X amount of time. And then if I just go out and get a single client that sells a million dollars a month, like done. Did it like, you know, we're set, but that isn't success for the platform. And so then um, you could go to the other extreme and say like, oh, I'm going to help X number of creators earn their first dollar. And that's all well and good, but everybody follows the big names. So if you don't have any of the big names, like it's way harder to get those. And so what I look for is the key metric, which is GMV and then the counterbalancing metric. And so in this case, we're looking to drive the most GMV. Um, that's the main thing. Small creators, big creators all contribute to that, but obviously the big creators drive far more. And then I have a counterbalancing metric of, I want X number of creators to have earned at least a dollar on the platform. So that says I'm going after this big number, but I also have to include all the small creators because two years from now, three years from now, they are the big creators. So that way I'm not trading short-term for success for like long-term uh, long-term results because, you know, five years from now, it's, if I get tens of thousands of the small creators, then I'm for sure going to have, you know, like they'll be the big creators five years from now. It reminds me, you think politics, and I know you, you dabbled on, on the Hill for a bit. It's sort of like when the folks report their fundraising numbers and it's average check size, you want millions of small donors versus yes. one massive donor. If you're going to build a movement. Yep, for sure. Okay, so that's the status of ConvertKit Commerce. Um, let me give a little bit of ammo here to our SaaS folks that are listening and going, I want tactics, Nathan is amazing. From what I can tell, you've used really three acquisition channels really effectively. Um, one, sort of the powered by ConvertKit. In fact, in one of your Twitter t- tweets, you said, hey, why did you upgrade? And there were folks going, we wanted to pay to remove the powered by ConvertKit. So you get obviously some free clicks and a lot of free traffic from that. I think you also have a great affiliate program 
program. I know to see Fleet Link in your guys' footer, and you also have big names that are known for promoting products they really believe in. Um, and then lastly, your SEO content seems to be super strong. You put some of the key anchor articles in your footer as well. So I'd love to spend five minutes just touching on those. Could we maybe start with like the Powered by Convert Kit? Can you quantify the success you've had using that as a growth channel? Yeah, so it's still relatively early. Um, just for some more context, we've always been a paid product, um, you know, like free trial, but you got to pay to use it until January of this year when we oh, launched okay. premium. Um, and so you can see like prior to this year, um, so last year maybe we were driving two to 3,000 visitors a week um, through Powered by Links. And then after launching Freemium, scaling that up, we're now driving uh, 14, 15,000 visitors a week from Powered by Links. So you're just seeing, and it's actually a couple step functions in there as we made our free plan more valuable, um, got the adoption up, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, now, powered by traffic converts a lot lower than other traffic. I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but you know, if a visitor to conversion, visitor to free account conversion rate is seven or eight percent, like in you know other channels, then powered by traffic might convert at one to two percent. So it's much more of this like broad awareness play than like a direct um, conversion. But just like not many traffic channels just keep climbing like that, and so it's really fun to see. Um, the next one search is really like just that anchor that we've, I don't know, gradually invested in over time. And now, um, it pays off in a big way. Um, and actually in a massive it. way. I mean, if you look at Ahrefs, I mean, you're now generate, you rank for almost 70,000 organic keywords. You're getting 120,000 clicks organically per month. I think that's unique. 10.2 million backlinks, which is obviously a credit to probably a bunch of hosted page products that you guys have, but I mean, you're killing it in SEO. Yeah. So it drives about 40% of all of our new accounts. Uh, wow. Is from search. One interesting, if people are looking for like a, a, a quick, tip for link building that's been fascinating. We didn't do it on purpose, um, but it's worked out really well is we've been doing these creator stories where we profile creators, tell their story, and we've been paying for photographers to come out, you know, and like a local photographer to come do all the photos for the story and give it to the creator and say, Hey, use these on your website, use these. Cause if you've ever built a website for yourself. You're like realizing, Oh, and here's where I'll put the perfect header. And you realize like, I don't have that. I haven't hired yeah. a photographer to do that. And so people love it, right? When we give those uh, away. But then what we also did is say, hey, we have this Unsplash uh, collection of creator photos. If you'd like, we'll release those, you know, if you sign off on it and you're up for it, we'll release those photos um, on Unsplash as part of our ConvertKit, you know, creator collection. And that has like, there's millions and millions of downloads of those photos now. And a bunch of people will credit ConvertKit. But what's interesting is on all the popular sites that use them and they get used a lot, we just send a quick little outreach email and say, hey, I saw that you use this photo. Um, I'd love it if you uh, provided a backlink back to, you know, if you linked back to ConvertKit as the, the creator of this photo. If not, no worries. It's like licensed under Creative Commons. You know, like you don't have to. Yep. But if you want to, we'd love it. And that has driven so many backlinks because wow. you get these photos that millions of people are using and they're just like, oh yeah, sure. I'd love to give credit. And especially when you're up front of like, you don't need to at all. Like we're not coming and saying you have to do this. Like Fascinating. How much did you spend on photog on local photographers featuring your customers in 2020? Do you have a general idea? Uh, that's a good question. We, um, I don't have that. I'd say 500 to $1,000 per shoot somewhere okay. in there. And then maybe one, one shoot per week. Um, okay. Got it. So 50, it's this, this tactic could, you know, cost 50 to hundred thousand dollars per year. Yeah, um, exactly. Uh, and you get direct return in the form of these backlinks, but you also get just amazing community return. I mean, this helps, this helps your customers in so many ways and it's free. Yeah. So this is kind of the way that I think about marketing is if there's an activity that we're going to do, like we're, we're going to release, um, these creator stories because we want to be a brand known for, um, great storytelling. I, I think all the most iconic brands are storytellers. And so we're like, great, okay, let's start telling stories. And then we need to, we need a process for that. So there's like, we need to do photos for the stories. We need to do these other things. And you end up with this sequence of events that you do. And you do this over and over again. 
And I think that's the way that most people approach marketing or whatever task of like, I have to do A, B, and C, and I will do that a bunch of times. And uh, now I guess it's Jim Collins in Good to Great talks about flywheels and taking all of these sequences of events and turning them into a flywheel where each step logically feeds into the next and around and around you go. And so we think about it in marketing of these different like these stories, you know, we want to produce a great story and it needs writing and photography and around that. And since we're producing the photography, we should promote that and share it as many places as possible. So that's where these unsplash collections come in because then that will get more attention for the stories. And then our, our search for like SEO flywheel should fit into that of like, oh, since this asset is being created and millions of people are downloading it, let's, you know, tie that into our link outreach and and basically you see how can I make these different systems that when they fit together, every, you know, every rotation of the flywheel makes the next rotation easier. Um, and I look for that everywhere of, okay, great. If we're doing this one activity here, how can it serve the rest of the business or how can it have these other byproducts that um, are you know, really valuable? Nathan, is there somebody on your team that is that you've hired that is solely responsible for watching systems that other people are running, documenting the system, and then creating the flywheel? Or do you try and build that into the DNA where everyone, if they do something that works, they have to document it and share it so you can invest in systematizing? Yeah, I would say um, there's not one person. Uh, the person who does it the most is Barrett Brooks, who's our COO. Okay. Um, and he's been with the team for quite a while. He started working in marketing and then grew to leading marketing and then is now the COO. Um, so he's probably the best at it, but it's definitely something that we're trying to teach everyone to do. And like Issa Adney, who runs, she's our, her title is storyteller. Um, she's the person who we like taught this to at a high level, like in the company. And she's just like, okay, I'm going to take that concept and run with it and take it so much further than you thought. And so she is the one that's implemented all of that. And to give you an idea where it's at now, um, I'm working on a book called Create Every Day. And so in writing those chapters, I'll get stuck and I'll be like, okay, I need, what do I need? I need a story of a creator who uh, created really consistently every day, you know? And so I'll be like, Isa, what do you have there? And she goes to her database of all the creators that she's interviewed and says, here's four of them. I'm like, oh, perfect. I dive into the stories. There's already great photography. There's already these quotes and everything. And then I'll, I'll come back a while later. I'm like, okay, I need someone who uh, really persisted for a long time and didn't get the success early. You know, they got it three years, four years in. And she's like, goes to her database and she's like, oh, wait, here's these four people, right? And so it, obviously we're doing the work to tell the stories, to build the brand that we want, but we're trying to do it in a way that serves everybody else. So then when our content team is writing something about uh, how to use commerce or a new, like uh, how to do email marketing or growing a list, like they're pulling these snippets and examples from the rest of the, of the content machine, basically. This, this is, this is fascinating to hear um, how you, how you build all these on top of each other. You know, you, you've now, you've now stacked a bunch of these things. And one of the things that I'm curious to ask you is you, you clearly focus on community I mean, you must at some point see yourself almost like a talent agency for creators where you're making them their own celebrity with the photos, with the distribution, and there then that enables them to get attention and build their own brands. Do, do you ever think about that? Are we going to see a convert kit talent agency for creators? I don't think we're going to see that to quite the same extent of like us trying to get bookings and, and things like that. We're, you're definitely going to see it. Um, down the road from a marketplace perspective of here are featured products to buy and you know here's the best um the best ebooks uh the best photography resources you know all of those sort of things as we're driving the when does know, that launch when's the convert kit marketplace launch it's probably a couple years off um, okay just for like a little bit of uh i don't know i don't know if it's inside baseball or what but marketplaces are very a trendy, exciting thing to do. And one thing we almost went from what we have today right into like, and then let's do a marketplace. And what we realized is when it com comes to discovery um, and getting, you know, using the attention of the platform that we have for more creators to be discovered, there's a lot that we could do of making each piece of content created in ConvertKit um, available to be discovered on other platforms. 
So if you think about internal discovery versus external discovery, internal is like, oh, you just finished reading this article or because you're subscribed to James Clear, you should also subscribe to Tim Ferriss, you know, like that kind of thing. And that's like what Medium has done a lot of and um, that sort of thing. But what we realized is the step we need to do first is the external discovery of the little things of like, oh, I just subscribed to Nathan's list and it pops up and says like, hey, you should tweet about it. And we put these little moments all the way through. So every time you buy a product, every time you subscribe to a list, um, like these little viral loops happen for the creator. And basically we'd be getting ahead of ourselves if we're like, oh, let's do it on our platform. When really we're trying to say like, no, let's get it out there onto, let's automatically post to Twitter on behalf of the creator. Let's automatically mm-hmm. do these, these other things. So it's basically external discovery first and then later do the internal once the platform is bigger. Before we move on to profit sharing and how you build a great team and keep great humans around you building ConvertKit, touch on affiliates real quick. How much revenue did you pay out to affiliates in 2020? I don't have that number off the top of my head. Um, affiliates has been a huge channel for us and and it's been declining. Uh, let's see, affiliates is growing. I would just say that other channels have been growing faster. Um, so affiliates are how we grew you know, substantially for a long time. And at one point affiliates... Um, we're driving uh, a little over 30% of all of our revenue. That's probably dropped um, into the 20, 20% range as like the, well, so if we talk about flywheels or compounding, you know, these things, affiliates kicked off a lot faster. And then now you like over time, you get search coming in lower or like more slowly, but then search turns into this monster. Know, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so it's like affiliates are still growing. It's just that search is now outpacing it as far as the the growth. Um, so yeah, affiliates have been absolutely massive. And it's just that like a lot of it is the type of business that we're in, mm-hmm. right? If we're selling to traditional businesses, then like we had an affiliate program, then at your chamber of commerce event, that's not a thing anymore. But yeah. um, <laughs> you know, you'd be like, oh, let, I'm using ConvertKit. You tell like three of your friends, but in the community that we're in, right? A blogger used us and loves us and and, tells 10,000 of their closest friends, like use ConvertKit. So do you know how many affiliates you paid at least a dollar out to in 2020? Yeah, it'd be at least 3,000. Oh, um, wow. Okay. I mean, that's, a, you know, sometimes you hear a lot of concentration in these programs. That is not, that doesn't sound like huge concentration. Yeah. And the concentration is definitely there, um, you know, and so there's probably uh, only a hundred that are making at least $10,000 a month. Okay. Um, but there's some in there that are making 25,000 a month or more. Um, so yeah, there's there, it's a really, really solid program. So just, just make sure I understand that Nathan. So if you've got at least a hundred affiliates making 10 grand a month and some making way more, I mean, that's a million. Yeah. Right? So that's, like that's probably too high of numbers. I'd have okay. to dig in more. Okay. Um, okay. I was going, wait a second. There's no yeah, way that 60% that, of his cost base is affiliate expenses. Yeah. No, that's too high. So okay. I'd have to, I'd have to dig in. Um, cause it might only be 20 or so. Okay. But I, there I, is some concentration of it. What you're saying is there is some concentration at the top. Yeah. So we're paying out about 250 that we can figure this out. We're paying about 250,000 a month to affiliates okay. uh, and paying a 30% commission. So that's the easiest way to back into it. That's great. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So 250 um, affiliates, we can do an average into the 3000, but it's clear there's some concentration of with some driving 25 grand a month in like affiliate payouts. Yeah. So if we're going to divide that out. We're, we're at about, 830,000 in monthly, uh, like top line revenue driven by affiliates. Yeah, that's okay. That's a really valuable number. Thanks for sharing that. So, so are these, are there, before we move on to how you've structured profit sharing, are there any other flywheels that like, you just found it you love it. You haven't written a blog post on it yet. You haven't put on a podcast. You probably don't want to share it, but I'm going to pressure you. Anything you yeah. should ask about? Uh, I think, I think our free plan, you know, in okay. the <laughs> software community, um, everyone's very adverse to free. They're like, no, I, I charge for a product. I, I sell things and we get paid for the value that we provide. We're not those Silicon Valley startups that like don't have a business model or like are losing money on every customer. And there's truth to both sides of it. But I, I just read, well, so two things. Uh, in 2018, I sat down with Ben Chestnut, the CEO of MailChimp uh, at the Inc. 5000 conference. He was super generous with his time. We just got to chat for 30 minutes in a hotel lobby. And he was just like, look, free was huge for us. That is the inflection point. And it still is huge. 
And it's not a bunch of low value customers. It is those, but it's all of these high value customers that just show up. And you're like, where did this 100,000 subscriber account come from? And you're like trying to attribute it. And you're like, you know, you're not, you can't figure out like it's not from paid. It's not from search, you know, it just doesn't make sense. And so you do customer interviews and your product managers sit down with this account. You find out that this marketer used the free version of MailChimp, spun up a free account, did some stuff, learned how to use the product, grew it to, I don't know, 50 subscribers, 500 subscribers, something that's not material for MailChimp, and then got a job at, you know, this big company who was using constant contact. And he's like, no, I'm not using constant contact for this. Let me go use MailChimp, which is the tool that I (laughs) know how to use. And so basically freemium drove all of this where they would get big accounts switching over, knowing how to use the tool right away. And he was just like, this is, this is mind blowing. This is amazing. And um, we were in the process of figuring out how could we offer a free plan? We basically looked at it and said, look, what if as a, a profitable company with plenty of cash in the bank and all of that, we started to adopt some of these more like Silicon Valley startup methodologies and said, we don't have to make money from every customer up front. We can play this long game because we're profitable. Um, and, you know, so we launched that free plan and, and honestly, it's doing so well. We, in our models, we expected a 3% free to paid conversion rate. Mm-hmm. Um, we came in at a 5% rate and we we're like, that's fantastic. Um, and, and you, you know, we, and just to be free. clear, Nathan, sorry, that's, uh, do they, do you require a sign up when they, uh, sorry, a, a credit card when they sign up for free trial? So, um, you can sign up for a free, a free account without a credit card. Okay. And then if you want to try out like our automations product or something like that, you can start a free trial for the paid version. And that requires a credit card, you know, to okay. go from the free version to trialing uh, that on a 14 day trial. Um, and, and then and you're saying you expected 3% conversion and it got five. Yeah, three, yeah. 3%. So not 3% conversion on the trial, but 3% of um, all free accounts converting to a paid account. Wow. Uh, and wow. it ended up at five. And we we see a lot of opportunity to bump that a little higher, maybe to six or seven percent. Um, and that's let's, what I try to do next year. Let's talk about, you know, let's wrap up with two two topics here. One is keeping great people around you, um, right? You're not venture back, so you can't just go pay people three million a year to stick with you. And that's not a race that you want to be in anyway. Uh, okay. when did you launch profit sharing and how does it work? Yeah, so we have iterated with a lot a lot of different profit sharing things. Um we launched profit sharing on our very first team retreat. Um, as I, we talked about earlier. What year was that, Nathan? Sorry, 2016? 20, yeah, summer 2016. Okay. Um, and we had grown from 100K to 300K in monthly revenue. We'd saved up three months of expenses in the bank. We'd gotten to 50% profit margins through like the team being really lean. And I wanted to reward the team for it. And so we took 100 grand and paid it out to the team in profit sharing. Uh, everyone was totally blown away. Um, How'd you do that though? How many, how many were on the team at that point? 12? Uh, we were up to 20, uh, but six of them had been hired in the previous like 30 days. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so 14 participated. Yeah. I, everyone participated, but for some people it was like 600 bucks, you know? So how did that's That's my question is if someone right now is finishing 2020 with a hundred K and they want to do this exact same thing, how do you decide who to give the check size to? Is there a formula? Yeah. So what we do is we do a six month period um, is when the profit sharing is. And so for everyone that has been there for the entire period, you're eligible for it. And we actually give partial credit. So we give out, like, if you joined, we have people who will join and then like profit sharing is 30 days later. And they're like, you still get 500 bucks, <laughs> you know? That's amazing. Cause we want them to kind of have that taste of it. Yes. And the person yeah, yeah. next to you got 17,000 or something, yeah. but like that's cause they've been with the company for quite a while. So in that pool, um, it is 75% based on you're just a team member and everybody participates equally. And then 25% is based on time with the company. So we take, uh, there's just a spreadsheet that has everyone's start date. Like, so all the team members, their start date, how many days, since that and it totals up you know the total days um worked uh like ever and then it it distributes you know so it just says x percentage of this pool should go to charlie because she's been with us for four years to you know 
this person because they've been with us for one year. Um, Interesting. So like the profit sharing that we did uh, in the spring, let me think. The average was $11,000 per person. Mm -hmm. um, the smallest check was $3,000 for someone who had joined really recently. And the biggest was, I think, 19000 And so that's kind of the swing that, uh, that you'll get. We used to have something in there where we, we had another score for individual performance. Um, and we took that out and we basically decided we're going to set a high bar for performance, just like to work at this company Default. and then everyone yeah. wins and loses together. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Okay. And you're, you're paying this out. You're doing a calculation once a month or once every six months, every six months. Okay. Got it. Interesting. Okay. And so, so you're going to be doing this sometime soon in the next 30 days, as you close out 2020, um, what's the total pool that you'll be paying out? Um, it'll be 400,000. We, okay. our goal was actually to lose money in the second half of the year. And, and now you sound like a tech crunch, thirsty headline chaser, VC guy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> our goal is um, to lose money. <laughs> we, we have not spent much on advertising as a company and this year. Yeah. We're like, okay, we're going to double down and we're going to spend aggressively on, uh, you know, brand and product advertising. And we, we didn't do that. We spent a bunch in the first half of the year, but we were still way more profitable than we expected. We doubled down further in the second half of the year. We're st and our accounting team last week was like, guys, we're still profitable. <laughs> you know, like, um, so it's going to be smaller. I think the average check size is going to be five grand instead of like the 11 that it was last time. But do you hear any pushback from teammates when they sort of have already calculated what they think their check's going to be? And then you guys decide you want to spend more aggressively. So there's less profit to share. And how do you balance that? Yeah. So one, we like the same, all the transparency that you see on the outside, we have even more transparency on the inside. So for example, um, you know, we have a full open book so everyone can see all the expenses, see what we're, what we're spending and, and everything. Um, and we just are really upfront about all of the trade-offs in the business. So we talk about this like short-term versus long-term and what the effects are with compound and growth and everything else. So I think of uh, compensation in two different ways that kind of makes a quadrant. So I think of short-term versus long-term compensation and then I think of guaranteed versus performance-based. So short-term guaranteed is salary. Uh, Long-term guaranteed is like 401k match, you know, retirement. Mm -hmm. um, short-term performance-based is profit sharing and long-term performance-based is equity. And what I think that does is it makes this whole, like this matrix where it's all covered and you're taken care of in each way. And the, the individual team member can get a feel for the, the trade-offs that the business is making. So for example, I, as a founder, I'm like, let's spend right now because let's get on the growth trajectory that we want on our path to 50 million ARR, or hundred million ARR. And you don't want a team member to be like, no, no, no. I want money in my pocket. Profit sharing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so by having them participate in each side of it, they get to live in that tension that you as a founder live in and they go, okay, yeah, let's invest now because profit sharing will be bigger down the road. And because, um, you know, my equity is going to have more value down the road. Mm -hmm. So what portion of 58 companies, Nathan, besides your own equity, what portion of the company do the teammates own currently? Yeah, so I own 90% and the, um, the team pool is 10% of great. which 7% is currently allocated. That's great. That's great. Okay. And yeah, paid spend is growing drastic. I'm just looking at Ahrefs while we're doing this. I mean, you used to like May rank for like and pay for 325 keywords and now it's at like 4X, that's like 1200 keywords. Um, so clearly you're running experiments there. Yes. Interesting. How much are you spending per month now on paid ads? I think about 400,000. Okay. Interesting. And how do you, I mean, is it working? Um, it's working decently. Um, there's a lot of things that we're having to figure out. We're able to drive a lot of free accounts. Um, but one, for example, we found that our mobile experience isn't as good as it should be. And so, you know, inexpensive, uh, accounts to drive our mobile accounts but if you don't have that a great in-app mobile experience then you know they're not going to convert or they're not going to um, have a good uptake so there's a lot that we've been trying to figure out um the other thing is we've been we're about to kick off some big new brand campaigns where we actually hired like a major marketing agency to produce like video brand ads for us oh interesting so 
we'll see how that goes. Um, but that's why not hire why time. not hire little videographers and send them to your creators and have them shoot like raw a little blurry videos that seem like really real and it's like a cook and it's flashing on the lens and yeah i mean there's the whole uh, all kinds of different ways to to do it and i think we're just excited to see actually what's funny so uh, the agency we hired is uh mechanism and they're based out of new york and jason harris who uh runs it i don't know him very well but we're both investors in the ghost town together oh nice and and they do stuff for alaska airlines and peloton and everybody else you know and so that's one of those things of uh sort of keep it in the family in that way yeah I well i like that and that brings me up to where i want to wrap this up you know going back to your ladders of wealth creation that you've modeled time for money your own services product type services selling products and then there's this next level which is hey you know, not only Nathan is making money, like you are making money from ConvertKit, but your team members are too, and there's sort of capital leverage. And so, mm-hmm. you know, you write your, about your investments on your website, like, you know what, I enjoy working with these people. They're my friends. I'm going to give them capital and see what happens. Can you talk to me about that? Because I don't see that on the ladders of wealth creation sort of chart you've built. How are you thinking about literal, you know, you know, capital leverage moving forward for Nathan Barry? Yeah, I think it's not on the chart because it's relatively new for me of, you know, if you look at my, my earnings, they trail like convert kids growth, like my earnings trail that by a few years, right. Of, um, that's something interesting that my wife and I talked about of like, it was only three years ago that we like, didn't really have, you know, like the things were really tight, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I think that's something that I'm uh, learning a lot right now and is just what that investing looks like. And, um, Someone that I follow a lot in that space is Andrew Wilkinson from Tiny. Um, it's just fascinating to see him deploy capital. Um, and it's just been been fun to read books like uh, The Outsiders or you know Snowball about Warren Buffett or some of these other books of like, okay, wow, you know, it's not just all angel investing and stuff like that. I have a you know, a decent number of angel investments. Not not a lot. I think maybe nine. Um but um, what I'm trying to do more of now would be inspired by like what Andrew's doing or Warren Buffett style of like, great, can I buy 10% of a company? Um, and then so like uh, there's an e-commerce brand that I was able to do that with um, Which this one? year. Uh, they're called Harkla. Okay. And they're, um, they sell products for special needs um, and they just have incredible opportunities to, to grow. Um, and then, you know, we, we acquired a, a minority share of a company called Spark Loop. Um, so we're, we're basically looking for what are these things where we're, instead of buying a tiny percentage through an angel investment, we could buy 5%, 10%, 20%. Um, and then it could become part of a, a portfolio that could eventually feed each other. When, when is the Nathan Berry convert kit rolling fund, but private equity version, not VC version launching? I don't know. Probably the biggest thing that I'm torn on right now is chasing after some of these fun opportunities. Like I have a real estate business here in Boise that I started with two friends, mainly because they had all this energy and the desire to like move up the ladders of wealth creation, but needed some more help and needed capital. And so to do that with them has been really, really fun. But then at the same time, all the opportunities in ConvertKit. Like let's say if we're valuing ConvertKit at 7x ARR, 8x ARR, something like that. I think that's conservative for even for what what you've built, yeah. Um, Then you're looking at what it takes to add an additional million dollars in value, in enterprise value for ConvertKit versus what it takes to go make a million dollars somewhere else. And it's just an order of magnitude more effort to do it in uh, real estate investing or something like that because ConvertKit has so much momentum. And so it's an easy trap to fall into of like, oh, I've made this money here. Now let me go to this other thing. When if you just look at the, the cold just hard leverage, facts, just let just straight up leverage, then the answer is this has worked. So let's keep doing it. Put in more effort there, go faster. Um, and so it's a balance between what's fun and like a little bit of a diversification and like, no, just keep doubling down on ConvertKit. Last question, Nathan, you sent out an LOI to buy a company this morning. Which company was it for? Can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that would be the answer. So let me back up. Where? How do you go about finding companies you send LOIs to? Yeah, um, that's a good question. 
so it's things, markets that we're spanning into, um, uh, something that is a, a good fit, something that we hear a lot from our customer base of like, if we see integrations popping up a lot, um, if we look at say our three-year roadmap and there, if there's a, a, something that we're planning to build, but it's a few years off. And then we see someone who is getting good traction in that space, right? Our customers are already using them. Then it's like, oh, we could accelerate a plan two or three years out if we buy them today. Um, especially when in any, in any software company, uh, engineering time is the single greatest constraint. And so there's so many opportunities to chase and you just have to take the um, Richard Branson quote of like, opportunities are like buses. There's always another one coming. Um, and so you end up in a point where capital is more available than like skilled engineering time to apply to problems. And that's when acquisitions start to become interesting of like, okay, I could accelerate this plan, um, you know, for a million dollars rather than having to spin up a whole new engineering team and and then spend a year building it. Guys, there you have it. Nathan Berry, 2005, a long journey when his parents dropped him off. He showed up with the van afterwards with 120 bucks of woodworking sales. Quickly got into college early, said, give me a to-do list of what I got to get done. Then landed a $10,000 contract, marketing contract, ended up dropping out of school to pursue that and eventually turned those professional services goods into a couple thousand dollars a month. But it really changed in 2015 when he started really focusing on convert kit community building and that first team retreat in 2016 when they paid out their first profit sharing to employees of hundred thousand dollars now 58 convert kit team members strong focused on building the creator economy they're empowering these creators in many different ways and they continue to drive growth 19 million last year and run rate up to 25 million dollars run rate today totally bootstrapped nathan barry thanks for taking us to the top thanks for having me boom guys cut nathan what'd you think man <laughs>